I think you can restart, Helen. Oh, brilliant. OK, um, welcome back, everybody, to the next session. And we're really delighted um, to welcome Valentina Gurenini. I'm sorry if I said that wrong, <laughs> um, to uh, talk to us about um, prospect research. Valentina is a senior director of the philanthropy division at WealthX, um, covering the commercial activities for higher education and for profit sectors in the EMEA and APEC areas. For five years, uh, Valentina has grown and managed the WealthX philanthropy client base. Uh, in these regions, supporting and developing teams on evolving their strategies to identify, attract, engage and cultivate affluent donors through targeted wealth intelligence. Prior to joining WealthX, Valentina worked as an event manager, so she knows it from that side too, for a global event agency in London, and it focused on um, organising fundraising events and charity galas uh, and top tier private events for affluent individuals. So I guess it gave a good insight into this uh, charity world of, of uh, fundraising with wealthy donors. We're very thrilled to welcome Valentina as our next speaker at the IFAB 2021. Um, quick introduction. So Valentina, it's uh, over to you. Oh, I've got a quick introduction as well. We've got a, a, a quick video to show about WealthX and to explain a little bit more about WealthX, what WealthX does. Uh, and then Valentina can lead us the way. When it comes to doing business with the world's wealthiest people, traditional engagement strategies fall short. Wealthy individuals have distinct preferences for how they want to invest, donate, and spend their resources, so it takes a tailored approach to connect with them. WealthX data helps you create an informed strategy for success. WealthX has developed the world's largest database of wealthy individuals, built and maintained by our global research team. We provide in-depth intelligence to help you gain a thorough understanding of your wealthy clients, donors, and prospects. WealthX empowers you to uncover and identify target individuals, understand their complete profile, from wealth analysis to interests and passions, as well as a map of their personal network, and build an effective engagement strategy that will make a connection with them. From nonprofits and higher education, to financial services, to those specializing in luxury items like yachts, jewelry, and more, WealthX will help you maximize your relationships with the wealthy. Contact us today to schedule your personalized demo. A lovely video. <laughs> I've actually <laughs> never seen sharing. that video. So oh, really? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a really nice one. Thank you for sharing. Valentina, it's over to you if you want to take the floor. Thank you, Alan. Um, and hello, everyone. Just confirming you can see my slides here today. Brilliant. I'm actually based uh, today. I'm in, in the US and so it's a little bit dark at the moment. So I hope you don't mind. I put a digital background with a bit of a, of a fake sunlight coming in. Um, but I'm normally based in London um, and work with all our philanthropy and education clients in Europe and in Asia. And today, um, other than talking about what the research, what is the research that WealthX conducts on affluent individuals. I really want to showcase a few case studies of uh, how our clients or organizations use this research for different types of techniques, whether it's uh, building your major donor strategy from the ground up or growing and expanding your, your reach. Um, and so let's start by who am I? Uh, Helen, I, thank you for that introduction. So it covers mostly everything. I've been at WealthX for now five years um, in based in Europe and I find this so interesting because the the cultural uh, the, the way of giving and the affluent space is dramatically changed in the next five years and we're expecting a huge transformation especially in the next few years going from Europe all the way to Asia um, so it's very very interesting um, interesting sector to follow. Um, when we talk about affluent individuals, um, we classify them in three tiers. Everyone has their own definition, but just so you know what we, we what these symbols mean at WealthX. For us, we talk about the ultra high net worth population, anyone with a net worth above 30 million. Of course, in that, the very top of the pyramid are the billionaires. They're about uh, close to 3,000 billionaires in the world and uh, close to 300,000 ultra high net worth individuals. Um, and that is 
the wealth X target, who we want to identify. Um, and then we move it down to the very high net worth uh, um, sector a pillar, which is uh, those individuals having a net worth between five and 29 million. Most charities, I have to say, <laughs> on, on this area, the very high net worth. It's quite interesting uh, just because someone has a lot of wealth doesn't necessarily mean that they're generous, but generally speaking, it's good to have a lot of diversification, both in terms of capacity of these affluent individuals and so have a very good understanding of who's who's within your network or within your prospecting reach. The, the, the uniqueness of or the beauty of this data is the fact that it is international. And I really want to strengthen or highlight this fact because these individuals are international. Now, every organization, um, maybe some have more of a local uh, effort or engage their local communities of affluent individuals. Others might have an international reach, but in any case, these individuals tend to have a lot of properties in different parts of the world, connect with different businesses in different parts of the world. So it's important to have the knowledge and the language expertise to be able to uncover everything um, that we can find on these individuals. And so how do we do that? Uh, we're very lucky to have this big team of analysts, 160 researchers. All they do from <laughs> all day is researching who these individuals are, what makes them tick, what their interests are. And I loved coming after the sewer sip session because all I could hear, everything we talked about was, personalization, knowing the individual you have in front. The major donor strategy is not one solution fits all. You have to tweak your strategy with the person that you have in front. And the research allows you to be prepared, do some homework and understand who is that person, both from a capacity perspective, what their wealth might be. And so we do a full net worth analysis, understanding not just only their net worth, but really practically what is their liquidity. And that can help you understand their propensity to give to a certain level. You mix that with potentially their philanthropic history. That gives you affinity. What type of causes have they supported? Um, are they passionate about conservation or are they passionate about arts and culture? Um, really allowing you to be more focused in, focused in your efforts, having more of a targeted approach to, towards affluent individuals is imperative because we don't have unlimited resources, unlimited time. And so this really helps you navigate um, your prospect pipeline and build a prospect pipeline. So with this type of research, we do, we look at open source intelligence. That is not just Google, of course, there's a thousand different sources that we use um, relying on real estate data, company data, donation databases, whatever we can find to build what we call the WealthX dossier that includes information on net worth, philanthropic history, interest, passion, and hobbies, the family of the, of the individual. That can help you understand the engagement strategy or the growth um, with a certain relationship within the family. You also want to understand the networks, who knows who and who do they know, and we will talk about that as well. And so the fact of doing this desk research in a world where it's all automated and all artificial intelligence is imperative to provide quality over quantity. In the world of affluent, in the space of affluent individuals, it's about vetted, qualified prospects that you can start engaging rather than trying, um, you know, thousands or hundreds of different names. I want to share a few slides as to where are we now in the ultra high net worth space. Um, this has definitely been two challenging years from an economic perspective, of course. Um, and there are some markets that has suffered more than others, especially in the space of the high net worth individuals. But um, in the contents of, of Europe, for example, we did see a bit of a decline combined uh, with everything that's been going on with Brexit, with the pandemic, a lot of the um, affluent individuals have made their fortune in customer uh, facing um, uh, industries and tourism and hospitality. So there has been a bit of a decline compared to other markets such as the US and in Asia. Um, however, and you can see this in the slide here. This is all coming from our World Ultra Wealth Report. Uh, we publish it every year and it's free to download on our website if you're interested in statistics on the affluent individuals. And we also have some um, zone in research uh, briefs on in certain markets as well. 
Um, we can see here in terms of the countries, uh, Germany and France have lost uh, quite a considerable amount of percentage in terms of affluent individuals and their wealth, and as well as United, K United Kingdom because of, uh, of Brexit and the pandemic combined. However, it's not all bad, and let me share why. The affluent individuals, although they have lost some wealth, the ones that have not lost their wealth actually made more uh, more um, during this, this period. On top of that, what has really been changing is the culture of giving. Individuals are much more philanthropic. Uh, there is much more of an awareness of the inequalities between um, it, different type of um, individuals within the population. Um, there's also a growing uh, awareness of the environmental and social issues across the globe. And I think now the conference in Glasgow is a great example. And so whilst we look at the interest of the individuals um, and where, where their primary roles are, you can see number one is, of course, banking and finance. Number two, business and consumer services. We have real estate, hospitality, and the philanthropy space, uh, either roles as board members or uh, trustees. It's number five, so one of the top five. Um, and although wealth is declining in some countries, uh, um, the donations are increasing. We've registered over $73 billion spent, donated. Uh, to philanthropic causes around the world. So it's uh, rapidly, and I think that's an increase of 16% um, over the last two years. So it's not all bad news. Um, keep doing what you're doing. Keep engaging these individuals because there is a lot of potential, not just from a donation perspective, but also from an influence and um, network referral perspective. And we'll look at that as well. Let's talk about future trends. Uh, some of these elements I've heard in the previous uh, session, um, but there is an evolution of, in, of the way to engage an affluent individual and philanthropic giving. Um, we hear so much talking about innovative uh, financial instruments. Uh, we, we hear a lot about the high net worth individuals wanting to be involved and in how they give and shaping that gift. Um, we also have um, larger expectation of the give back, um, the giving the pledge initiated by the billionaires in the US is probably a great example of that. And a lot of other um, billionaires, ultra high net worth and very high net worth are following suit. So what, with great wealth comes great responsibility. Um, and so there's more individuals giving back, um, but also the next generations, millennials, especially in the world of digital, as we are now, we, we mentioned that before as well, Millennials are extremely digital. They understand the importance of uh, being socially active. Um, they are not just there for, from a donation perspective, they're advocators, uh, they're ambassadors. So how, as an organization, how can I prepare for that? How can I welcome uh, this new type of philanthropy and maximize um, the impact that I can have from these type of engagements? And then um, we talk a lot about impact. Now, for a lot of, it's not always easy for organizations to show impact, um, but it's becoming increasingly important for affluent individuals as the competition for gifts is increasing, the ones that can build a strong personalized connections, the ones that can actually show an impact and show where that donation is going towards really allow allow themselves uh, to set up themselves for, for, for great success and for building long-term uh, relationships, long-lasting relationships. So we could talk a little bit about that as well. Now, these are buzzwords in the world of research. You probably already um, have seen a few, but where and why is research needed? So with each organization, there's different priorities, there's different strengths and different weaknesses. Um, with some, we focus on prospect research. They might already know who are the individuals they want to target. They might know them as maybe dormant in their database. They might know them through connections, but they don't really know who these people are. They know they have capacity, but as we mentioned before, capacity is just the first thing. 
there's just so much more that we have to uncover. And because resources and time are always scarce, we want to focus on the best prospects. So prospect research allows you to qualify a prospect, information on their philanthropic history, on their motivations, on their interests, passion, and hobbies. It allows you to understand what the best engagement strategy would be. We said it before, you cannot have the same strategy for all. You have to personalize that. So how can I engage with this individual? Is it going through the foundation? Is it going through a foundation where this individual is a trustee or uh, a member of the board? Or is it maybe going through an introduced sir. Um, understanding what are the best ways to get in front of this individual. And this is particularly true for, for charities um, that are looking to find new potential prospects. Um, but also prospect, prospect research helps you, uh, apart from the cultivation, also in the ask, what amount is the right amount? Now, research will never replace a one-on-one -on -one conversation that you will have with these donors. But research allows you to understand what elements to push on, what elements to avoid, and really how to stir the conversation in the direction you want it to head. Uh, so it's just about being prepared before these, uh, these uh, connections. Then the second aspect is network mapping. This is the buzzword of the pandemic in a world where we couldn't do events. Um, it was hard to connect with individuals. How could I get in front of them in a digital space? And so knowing who they're connected to, knowing um, who what we call the gatekeepers, the service providers, is a winning strategy for a lot of organization to establish that connection. But also think about your existing network of a, as an organization, as a university, as a school. How can I grow my reach by leveraging this network? And it's not just about asking an introduction. Can you introduce me to someone that could potentially be interested in this? It's about knowing who they're connected to, knowing the passions and motivations of the people within the second degree network, and having a targeted approach to that ask. I know you've met this person or you've been on the same board of this organization. I read it through this article on this newspaper. How interesting. Do you, and we're doing an event and I see that this person is also passionate about this cause. How about inviting them as well? Um, and I can see that they're, they're, I also know that their family is in certain type of philanthropy. It could be a family philanthropic journey. How about we target the whole family or the younger generations, whatever it might be knowing what your uh, strategy is with each individual. Um, and of course, in the setting of event. Uh, so I, I come from an event background. We used to do events where we were inviting people just based on wealth and potentially individuals that could donate and could bid high in the auction pri prizes. But now it's about sitting people that know each other at the same table, sitting ambassadors and very passionate donors with prospects um, that you're trying to cultivate. So making those connections happen for higher success. Then, of course, we talked about prospecting. Prospecting, I still hear today some organizations that target the top 100 wealthy people in their country. Wealth is, of course, one factor, but we want to go beyond what is just wealth. So finding those individuals that have an affinity to the cause, that have recently donated to similar organizations or have a lifetime giving towards a specific type of cause. Um, it's a matchmaking service, really, about finding the right individuals for that project, uh, but also the ones that want to be maybe involved if you're looking for uh, members of an advisory board, if you're looking for um, uh, individuals that could become an ambassador level, knowing who you want to target and how to build that relationship. Um, and then, of course, knowing about their propensity to give to a certain cause, knowing about the, the amounts and knowing about the linkage to your network. So these are the three aspects that we look at to qualify a good prospect. Some could be existing in your database as well. It doesn't have to be external. There's different techniques. And then I, I added um, this last section, which is becoming increasingly important, which is due diligence research. I would be curious to see if this is a, a buzzword or something that um, individuals in the audience look at, but diligence is growing massively. Organizations are refining their gift acceptance policy. Um, and it's something that I really invite you to think ahead of time, rather than uh, a donation comes in and you might not know, should I accept it? 
Uh, I'm not really sure about the background of this individual. It's balancing out between the risk and the opportunity, but it's important that as an organization, you have a system, uh, ethos, about what type of donations you accept from who and which areas are a big no-no. So reputation, uh, re protecting your reputation um, and diligence research helps you do that. We look at sanctions, we look at uh, how are they with their CSR practices within their companies? Um, are there any politically exposed individuals within their networks? And this is particularly tricky for individuals from China, Russia, Nigeria. So just protecting yourself as an organization with this type of research. And finally, why do we do research? We want to move from a reactive model to a proactive model. Reactive meaning the opportunities come to you, which is not as easy, but it does happen. You might get some major gifts or middle gifts and you work on cultivating those relationships. We want to move to a proactive model where you know ahead of time who you want to target, build that connection and really apply a proactive ethos to all the steps of the major donor cycle from identification all the way to stewardship. Now let's look at three case studies. Um, so curious to see as well and feel free, free to ask any questions and share what you've been doing within your organization. But um, curious to understand where you're at with this major major gifts. For some organizations, they've either been doing it for a while or they're starting now. Um, database qualification is where we always begin. Because if someone has donated or is in your alumni network, of course, uh, in the case of uh, uni a university or school, it's so much easier to target these individuals because you already know that there is a link. Um, in the case of a charity, they've already donated, they're already moved by the cause, but they might have not donated high. Very rarely someone starts with a major gift. It's a buildup. Uh, they test different organizations and only the ones that really build a strong personal connection, then you can succeed and, and receive that big gift. So in the case of, in this first case, a local NGO, so no international fundraising, extremely local, they wanted to move from a reactive way where they were just upgrading or trying to upgrade the middle donors. And again, just because someone is a middle donor doesn't necessarily mean that they have the capacity to become a major. Um, and we stepped in, we screen the database so we match their database with ours and we identified a wide pool of affluent individuals that were giving for the last five three years but very small gifts we then stepped in again and re requalified that list let's say we found 200 affluent individuals remember we're not in the business of quantity we're in the business of quality here out of these 200 who are the best prospects that I should focus my time and energy. Those are the ones that have been engaging with the organization the longest. Maybe the ones that have had a donation that have been increasing over the years. Maybe the ones that had a, one degree of separation to members of your board or to your leadership team, whatever it might be. Um, those are, again, applying affinity, capacity, and linkage, we requalified that list and we wanna focus on maybe top 10, top 50 highly qualified individuals. And that is combining a screening of the database, qualification of the database with additional analysis after that on the giving history or on the philanthropic history and linkage of these individuals. Another case study. We had an organization, a UN agency that didn't have a database. Fundraising with affluent individuals was completely new. They set up a foundation to do so. And we started off saying, who should we target? Now, again, we don't wanna go to the richest people of them all. We wanna go to the best highly qualified individuals. So what makes 
an individual qualify, individuals that have donated to similar causes, individuals that um, have a propensity to donate at a high gift level. Are you looking for a five, a six, a seven figure gift? Um, we then combined it with individuals that were already indirectly connected with the organization, maybe via a certain uh, contact, a certain foundation, whatever it might be. So we have the ability of adding different types of keywords to be able to build a targeted prospect pipeline of affluent individuals. So, so this is traditional 101 prospecting. You can see here an example of a search that we've done on our platform, being able to look for individuals that had ties to conservation, climate change, um, individuals that have more than 5 million. And I wanted to target those specifically that had a private foundation. And this is another interesting point, the lines between individual corporate and foundation philanthropy can be blurred. The value of building or growing a major gift strategy is not just for the one-on-one -on -one donation and the relationship that you can build, is as we said before, the influence that these individuals can have in other areas of fundraising, such as going into the foundation world or connecting you with companies for corporate foundation, uh, corporate donations as well. So it's also important to be able to always cross-check your strengths as an organization with all these different pillars. So, and then you can, of course, restrict it geographically. So individuals within Europe, Southeast Asia, or individuals in a particular city, if you're traveling to that city. Um, so really being able to have much more of a focused approach. We then look at the case study of network mapping. I have quite a few of these ones. I'm just going to mention two. One was a university uh, that had done pretty well with major gifts in the UK, and they had a um, they wanted to start reaching out to individuals or networks in the Middle East. They they've seen that there was a lot of potential there, but they didn't really know where to start from. What we've done is we looked at their alumni base and then we looked at individuals within the Middle East that were quite philanthropic in certain type of uh, causes in education. They were doing a lot on research and medical research. So looking at that as well. And then we cross-referenced the individuals that we found in the Middle East and highlighted the ones that had were connected directly or indirectly by one or two degrees of separation to their alumni. So they used, they created a network of volunteers of alumni to help them reach these new audience. So, so that is a way of thinking about it. But then you can see here, I mentioned corporate partners and foundations. Again, the lines are blurred between these, uh, these different spheres. So being able to, to find a way in via the strengths that you have within these sectors. And at the top right corner is an example of a network mapping. We call it a relationship graph that we build. So who does this person know that is affluent? What levels of affluence do they have? Are they billionaires, ultra high net worth, very high net worth? And the key here is also about understanding who are your powerhouses within your network, your ambassadors? You can create an advisory board. I saw a question on advisory boards as well. The crucial aspect of creating advisory boards is to set up expectations and be straight from the beginning as to what their roles are. Um, and instead of, again, asking for opening up of networks, it could be so much more targeted and say, we need to connect with this person we see you are both in that same board. How about we make it happen during the next trip? Just making sure that you can move the conversation in the direction you want it to, to head. So I'll leave you with this last slide and I hope I'm okay with time, Helen. Um, we, the major donor uh, cycle from identification to qualifying a prospect as a suitable prospect to cultivating that relationship to solicitation and stewardship. Where do you need research? You need it in all five areas to really make sure that you focus your time and energy on the right type of individuals, that you engage with them in the right way uh, toward with individuals, with introducers that can connect you and make that engagement easier. Um, to ask the right amounts. Um, and as Ruth was saying earlier, 
creates a personalized stewardship strategy. Someone is a fan of Arsenal uh, club, that little thing that makes a difference in order to be remembered in their minds and in their hearts um, as an organization that you have done a lot with and can really show the impact uh, of what you're doing. Um, so I'm just gonna leave you with this last slide. If you ever have any questions specifically to your market, uh, the world of the affluent individual is very hard to generalize. Each market is different, um, but I hope these trends were interesting. And, and tomorrow I'm gonna share the ones on Asia. You can click on the link. Um, and um, book a meeting with me. Uh, we can talk about what can be done in, uh, in, in your context. So thank you so much and off to the panel, I guess. Brilliant, thank you. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> thank you, Valentina. So much information, I think everybody will agree. Uh, really, really interesting. Uh, these slides didn't catch off the way. So if you didn't catch all the information, Valentina, uh, was was talking about then we can get them on chat and you connect and you'll be have access to them uh, so you can uh, go back over the slides so really I mean where, where do we begin with all this information my my first question is what what would you say um, where would a lot of researchers waste too much time because you want to do some prospect researching and and it takes a lot of time to do that so maybe the first question would be I mean I think you've touched on it already but maybe talking to some of the panel and I'll put this to the panel to say when you prospect research where would you say the best place to begin would be so I'd um, ask Arno you're on mute Arno yeah, I was saying thank you, Valentina. Great presentation, and uh, we are in the process of working together. So I was really happy to see this presentation. Um, well, Valentina expressed it, explained it very well. Like, it, like there are lots of ways of looking at uh, prospect research and at what what level when you do it. And uh, actually, Valentina showed that you have to do it at every step. Of the of the of the donor approach process and cultivation and stewardship, um, just taking a, a, an example that I have right now, and Valentina knows about it because uh, we're working on it right now. I have this uh, new client in Africa, actually in Cameroon, and uh, it's a foundation created by uh, a very wealthy and uh, bi business women. Uh, in in, Afri in Africa, uh, she has a, a great network of uh, of uh, ultra high net worth individuals and very high net worth individuals. Uh, but uh, we also need to uh, work uh, further than her, her network, and uh, we're going to work with uh, with Wealthex to uh, identify. Um, people, uh, major gift donors that have been uh, interested in, in what the foundation is doing. And it's a very tricky case because uh, the foundation is a mix of um, contemporary art and um, um, uh, conservation environment. Uh, so we're looking at people that are, that are interested in both topics or, or maybe each topic but could be converted to be interested to the other topic. It's very tricky. Uh, and I'm really happy to, to work on this case with, uh, with Valentina because it is tricky. And I think we, we, I'm sure we're gonna find uh, solutions. But um, yeah, each case is a different case and, um, and same with prospect research. Great, thanks. Thanks Arno. Graham, would you agree? Would you say the same thing? Absolutely, and, and thank you, Valentina, for the presentation. Um, you know, prospect research can be a bit like accounting, a bit dry, but you made it very, very interesting. So thank you for that. Um, my, my thoughts are, uh, you know, wealthy people don't become wealthy by giving all of their money away. So don't steer clear of the wealthiest, but uh, you know, look at your um, database and your your prospects across the spectrum. Quick example at Kingswood, um, we are the oldest Methodist school. So a lot of my older um, members of the, of the community are um, 
Methodist ministers, retired Methodist ministers. So we're not in a sense a wealthy school. We do, however, have one billionaire that I know of, who is a former parent. Uh, to cut a long story short, when I arrived, this sadly, there'd been a falling out with the parent and one of our teachers, and we won't tell you why, but anyway, that was a long time ago. Um, so it was almost a case of, oh, don't worry about them. You know, they won't give you any money, blah, 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 blah. So, of course, that's a red rag to a bull. I said, well, absolutely. How can we engage with this family? As luck would have it, uh, this family's son and two sons and daughter came to Kingswood. So not only we former parents, we've got former pupils. And the one, the youngest son has got a child at the school. And the youngest son gives a very, has given a very small amount to the school through his foundation, a very small amount, but it's regular. So we've been biding our time. Fortunate for us, the other son um, has sent his two children to Kingswood now as well. So we have three generations at the school. Um, and we finally, after four years of communicating, connecting, um, we met with the son and the headma headmaster and I met with the son, chatted to him, thanked him for his ongoing giving. That was the, the hook to get them involved. Um, and we asked him to, we shared with him, asked him to support one of our major capital projects, which he's seriously considering. So it, you know, we've done this through our own research. We obviously did this research with the family's company, which is a well-known company, quite easy to find out. But don't only focus on your major prospects. Look across the spectrum um, because there are people often who will give um, you know, a lot for them, um, which might not be a lot for you, but can build on from that side. Great. Thank you, Graham. That's what it's, it's really interesting to hear from an educational perspective and also how you then you cultivate, again, we're going back to the cultivation, aren't we, of, and a steward, the donors that, uh, that you feel have perspective to get more. Listen, if you've got experience of a similar situation, you've got uh, uh, experience of work with billionaires. <laughs> In my experience, wealthy people are generally all connected and um, one never knows just what the common interests are. But I think, and, and Valentina, I really appreciate your insight and sharing that with us. And one thing you mentioned was um, the importance of events as well. And, and, and I find that by hosting various events for like-minded people, um, one is introduced to possibilities that you would never normally have had, you know, in, in your room. And um, that opens conversation and, and starts um, relationships with, with just by, by broadening your, your circle in, in having that, that event. And, um, you know, that's just where the little fire starts and then it ignites and, and it grows to something you, you beyond your imagination. Yeah. Olivia, have you got anything to, to add to that? Yeah, probably um, it's about connection of uh, those uh, major donors as well. Um, so they, they, the idea would be for me to start with uh, turning your major donors into advocates of your cause. Because, for example, if you come from a culture, banking culture in Switzerland, it's about discretion. So you wouldn't have all the data you need. Uh, probably, I'm not sure you have them in your database, Valentina, for example, of all the major donors you can find in Switzerland, in Geneva area. The, this would be uh, done uh, mainly uh, through the network, through the people you have in, in, uh, in, in already as a, as a major donor. And uh, the idea is to open the conversation, as Leslie said, so be able to talk about, uh, about the person you're going to meet instead of starting to talk about uh, your, your own uh, organization. And um, we've seen also a lot, just to jump into another subject, in Switzerland at least, and I think that in France also, is that donations are increasing with the pandemic, but mainly from individuals and major donors, individual major donors, but we've seen a decrease uh, into uh, major gifts from foundations. And uh, uh, institutional fundraising is getting to be a struggle for many organizations currently. Yeah, great. Great, thank you. Uh, this is kind of to Valentina, actually. What would you say, as well as Wealthex, what other tools are available 
um, or what other um, you know facilities or tools or, or, or products potentially could people use as well as WealthX to begin their prospect research? What would you suggest? I would say start off looking within your own database um, just by postcode information, bank information that can give you some insight into uh, potential wealth if someone lives in a certain area. Um, but in terms of research, there's two different types of, of, um, of products. One is the one done by artificial intelligence, by automation, by algorithms, which is powerful, but it's much more of qualifying a large data set um, and so can be used only in some cases. When we talk about prospect research, um, it's much more about hand curated research. Um, I would say it really depends on the market. Uh, every market has different types of sources and that is why languages are extremely important. Um, at WealthX, we recently acquired three other businesses, Bordex and RELSI that do specifically only network mapping because we've had so many conversations over the last three years of network mapping becoming so powerful. And it's not just about, as, as, um, as Leslie said, these individuals are connected, but sometimes by just asking, you don't obtain <laughs> what you would like to. So it's just about mapping that out beforehand um, so you know who to push and in which direction. Um, so the network mapping tools are becoming increasingly more important. So RailSci and Bordex. Um, and we also recently acquired Wealth Engine, which is more of, a, of an American product. So I'm just not gonna mention it. Uh, but then I really invite you to look at foundation data, who is behind a foundation uh, that could give you some insight into affluent individuals. Um, there isn't a lot of data to be honest, in Europe and in Asia. It is something that's growing. We're not at the level of the US uh, where they've been doing this for 10 years. That is predominantly because of the laws. There's just, we're more, we're more private uh, in Europe and in Asia, rightfully so. Um, and so we have to take this into consideration. The world of research in these markets is not something that you access quite easily. Um, and the only reason why we've been able to do it is because we do it by hand and we have these researchers. We won't be able to do so much automation in this part of the world because, um, because of just the way the, the data, what data is available. Olivia, do you want to, to respond to that? Because I saw, I saw both you and Leslie nodding away. Um, and I just wondered whether, what other resources you guys have used for your prospecting? Yeah, I was actually going to ask another question to Valentina and the other one. So probably if Leslie you want to answer. go back to that, then yeah, it's fine. I'm good. You go ahead. Oh, OK. So, Leslie, if you want to say, you know, what what maybe other resources you've used for prospecting and then Olivia, we can ask your question. OK, it's I literally have an, and it came up earlier in one of the comments um, in the chat room about advisory boards. Um, I, I felt that even though we have, you know, a, a board um, of directors for our company, uh, it's been very useful to have advisory boards. It's really just um, not only given us the expertise in, in various areas, but it's also grown our family of ambassadors um, substantially. And um, I have just you know, realize the importance of having ambassadors, not only in South Africa, but um, in, in various countries for um, Cape Town Opera. Um, the amount of introductions that have come out of that have been so useful because it's people that know our company, not only know of our company, and um, that have had firsthand interactions and experience with our, our organization and have been able to very, um, um, accurately um, convey our narrative, our cause, our impact to people that want to support the arts in South Africa. Great. We were actually asked in the chat um, about low cost prospecting, low cost resources. So I guess we've kind of we've kind of looked at that already to look at your database, to look at who, you know, who might be there. Um, are there any other low cost? And then Olivia will come back to you. Uh, We've got some other suggestions on the chat, but any 
quickly because we're running a bit short time and quick kind of quick wins i guess so looking at low cost resources for prospecting let's jump in you have social network you can see connections of people if they're on social network this is a local solution to see who's connected to whom and who can introduce you uh, to another person if they are on social network and the younger generation is much more on on social network than before yeah and of course that's free so that's good. Good. olivia thank you thank you for that everybody olivia do you want to ask your question to valentina yeah that brings me to my question i was having a question about millennials um because we've we are seeing now a young generation of uh, wealthy people we, uh, young people wanting to dedicate one portion of their uh, wealth to, to a social cause. We have young social entrepreneurs, uh, young social investors. Um, but what we see in, in the new generation is that um, they are less attached to an organization than to a cause. They are focusing on a cause and they are changing the organization. So my question would be, how do you see in the future how um, building long-term with relationship would work with this younger generation? I completely agree. It is true. The way that they're giving is different, but they're much more focused also on impact. So if I was an organization, I would really try and build a long-term journey with these individuals that will show them the impact of their donation on a three to five year, and that builds a long-lasting relationship. Um, if they find an organization that is able to cater to their need for impact, I think that is the best way to have them stay. Mm -hmm. And also teaching values. Uh, when we talk about family, these young entrepreneurs, if they're self-made, they don't they didn't grow wealthy. And I think there is a lot of um, imp there's a, it's important to be able to show the values that philanthropy can teach to the their their younger generations. So creating a family philanthropic journey, I think, is UNICEF has done it um, highly successful. Um, so think about that as well if you're looking at young entrepreneurs. Great answer. Last question. Uh, is how straightforward is it to ask major donors to introduce you to their potential supporters? Graham, I was going to come to you. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to, to take that one. Um, generally speaking, as long as you have a relationship with your current major donor, if it's someone who's given you something out of the blue and you, you know, you've got no relationship, it is not that easy. But in my experience, you, know, you always ask your major donors after saying thank you, of course, is to say, who else within your network do you think would also want to support the project that you have so kindly supported yourself? And people are often very happy to share with their network what they are doing, um, not boast, not, you know, not um, make a big thing about it, but they're very happy to talk to their connections. And that's a way to expand your, your market. And within the schools, it might be other alumni. It might be in many cases alumni you know on your major prospect list, but in many, many cases, it's people you either don't know or didn't know had money. So absolutely ask your major donors as part of the stewardship process um, to uh, refer you on, um, set up meetings, uh, whatever works with them, absolutely do that. It's the old adage of uh, it's not what you know, right? So, you know, absolutely. Yeah, every time. Has anybody got anything else quickly to add to that just because we're running a little bit short on time? Anything else to add? No, fantastic. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there then. But I want to thank Valentina again for a really interesting and insightful um, presentation. I hope everybody can hear me. I'm getting some messages that my mics have gone a bit. Yeah, it's, not, it's not very good I'm no sorry. in the break i'll try and i'll try and adjust it so um apologies for that but i just want to thank um valentina and also obviously the panel again for your insight your help your uh you know your thoughts really really great um and we're going to come back again in 10 minutes so we'll be back at uh, 12 o'clock to listen to nancy Dixon talking about um tax and legal issues which uh is is important for everybody so please come back at midday uh 10 minutes time to listen to nancy talking about tax and legal and i just want to thank valentina again for a really really interesting insightful and educationally impressive <laughs> uh presentation so thank you so much for being in about 10 minutes <laughs>